We're reading this morning from Genesis um, chapter 13, right there at the beginning. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the Lord, on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarrelling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and Pezrites were also living in the land at that time. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarrelling between you and me, or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, towards Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, Lift up your eyes from where you are, and look north and south, east and west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Marmor at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. Good morning. Thanks for that, Rob. Uh, Before we get into this message that I've called The Providence of God in in Our Poor Decisions, um, I'm going to ask for God's help so that we might hear from him this morning. Let's pray. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would help us, that you would go before us, that the Holy Spirit would um, speak to us this morning of the things that you wish to teach us about, um, the ways in which you want to encourage us and move our hearts so that we might better serve you, that we might love you more, that we might be able to serve you more wholeheartedly. Father, we pray for your help, and I pray for your help as a preacher, that you go ahead of me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, It might not surprise you, I don't know, depends how well you know me, I suppose, uh, that I have made some bad decisions in my time. Uh, I, as I was thinking about this, I'm like, there's too many to even even count them. Uh, one of them was uh, when I moved down to Hobart the first time. So I grew up in Launceston. I came down to Hobart to study science at the University of, of Tasmania. And at that time, I didn't have my driver's license. Uh, I had waited a little bit too long, hadn't got around to it. And um, I was looking for a place to stay, and I ended up staying with this lovely family, but they lived at Acton Park, which, if you know that area of town, it's quite a long way from the Sandy Bay University campus, and I couldn't drive, and the bus service wasn't great out there. It wasn't a great decision. I could have lived somewhere a lot closer. I I don't think that was very wise. It became pretty hard, and in the end, uh, I didn't continue with that course of study and moved back to Launceston. The second time... Uh, I moved down to Hobart. Uh, we moved down south. Shelley and I uh, moved into where we are now. And I turned up for work uh, with the Department of Health and uh, talked to my, my supervisor, my manager. And it became clear that I hadn't really communicated 
that we intended to move permanently to the south of the state. And she was a little bit surprised by that, given that my job was to be responsible for the north of the state. Um, so not necessarily a, a great decision, uh, but it turned out okay. She I was able to work from the south of the state and it was fine. Now, there were so many bad decisions through my life, I, I don't even have the time to talk about them all. Uh, and yet, the providence of God has been evident through my poor decisions. Now, this isn't an excuse, right? This isn't um, saying that you can replace a belief in the providence of God for all prayer. All right, I'm not advocating for a lack of wisdom in decision making. I'm not advocating for recklessness. But what I am saying is that God is good all the time and he is so kind that we will in time see how his providence has been working to our good. Because that's certainly what we see in the life of Abram. Because there are at least three very poor decisions that I want to look at in this passage. And you see, not all poor decisions have the same outcomes. Some poor decisions actually have good outcomes. That's the first one I want to look at. A poor decision with a good outcome. Have a look again at verses 1 to 4 of chapter 13. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev. With his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev he went up from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, and where he first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now, you might remember when we left Abram two weeks ago, he and Sarai had... Uh, had, he had just had Sarai returned to him uh, because Pharaoh had taken Sarai as his wife. And we discussed how this deception on the part of Abram uh, was born of a legitimate fear. Abram acted out of that fear instead of faith and as we have saw, that, that led to great sin. Now there's no sugarcoating what happened here. Alright, this is maybe slightly uncouth language, but Abram pimped out Sarah to protect himself. And he profited from it. He was, it was premeditated. He knew that if they thought that he was, she was his sister, that they would take her and that she would be forced to sleep with Pharaoh. Friends, that's horrific. And he knew it would happen. He knew that they would treat him well because of her. Now Abram thought that the alternative was death. So so we might understand why he was tempted to do this. But you see the alternative wasn't death, was it? It was trusting God who had things under control the whole time. And here we are having left Egypt with all of those ill-gotten gains. And yet... There is a sense in which, and we'll see this a number of times through Genesis, that by Abraham leaving Egypt with all this gold and all these goods, that he's kind of prefiguring Israel during the Exodus when they leave Egypt with all gold and all these good things. The difference, of course, is that God made the Egyptians favorably disposed to Israel, but Abraham is rich because he sold his wife. Now, I realize that's harsh. But how else can we understand the events of chapter 12? But here's the thing. This is how quickly we can fall from faith to apostasy. This is how quickly we can go from worshipping God to violating his commands. And I don't think we should pretend that we're fundamentally better people. We're all capable of depravity. We're all fallen creatures. We're a lot like Abram. Fear can send us very far from God. I don't think it's for no reason that this is the first moment we read about Abram turning to God since that famine began in chapter 12. He's returned to the place he was before the famine, before fear overcame him, and he's called upon the name of the Lord. Friends, we can always return to God. We can always come to him. We're not too far gone. We aren't completely and irretrievably lost. We can always come home. 
And there's no doubt that God has used all of this. God's hand is in it all, protecting Abram from reprisals and all the wealth gained in Egypt will be useful to him. God has blessed Abram and his family, so much so that it will become a problem. But the point is that God uses our mistakes. God uses our bad decisions, even our sinful ones. And he's not the author of sin. He doesn't condone our sin. But if God couldn't bring good, even out of our bad and sinful decisions then he would almost never be able to do any good at all. Do you get that? That if God wasn't able to bring good out of our bad and sinful decisions, if he wasn't able to do that, then he'd almost be able to do no good at all because we're constantly making bad and poor and sinful decisions. I wonder if you've ever heard of the, uh, the sunk cost fallacy. Ever heard of the sunk cost fallacy? Um, so this is the idea that maybe, let's say, you have uh, that Land Rover. And you love this thing. This thing, you just love it. But it doesn't work as well as it should. I'm not casting aspersions. I know nothing about the subject, okay? I'm just saying it's a Land Rover because I know that's going to trigger a few people in here. <laughs> no, it's a Land Rover, but it, it constantly has trouble. You're constantly spending money to make it work. And, and it's gotten to the point where you've spent thousands of dollars on this thing and if you, it really, you could probably just replace it for less money. Right? But you've spent so much money on it that you feel obligated to keep going. That is the sunk cost fallacy. The money that you have spent is gone. You can't get that back. But if it, sometimes it would be cheaper just to replace it. You probably should do that. But we have this idea that we've spent all this money and now we have to keep going. Now where does this have anything to do with the Bible? I think that a lie that we're often told by the enemy is that we've crossed the line that we knew we shouldn't cross. We've already gone so far, we might as well keep going. We might as well keep going. You might as well keep drinking. You might as well keep looking at that stuff on the internet. You might as well keep uh, hold on to that addiction. Since you've gone so far already, you might as well keep going. And that's the lie. That's the enemy. You're never too far gone to come home. The best time to turn to God was before you went down this road, right? The first time to turn to God was before you went down that road. But the second best time is now. You're never too far from God to return. Now that was a poor decision with a good outcome. This is a poor decision that we're going to look at now. It was an okay outcome. It works out in the end. Have a look at verses 5 to 9. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together. For their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarrelling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarrelling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. It's not the whole land before you. Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Now the problem is straightforward enough. It's not very complicated. Too many animals, too many people, not enough land. This is one of those nice-to-have problems. God has blessed both Lot and Abram. They've accumulated so much wealth, it's beginning to cause fights. The solution is also simple. Let's go separate ways. You go one way, I'll go the other. Now, on first blush, I think it looks like Abram is being wise, and it makes us think of the psalm, Psalm 133, verse 1. Right? It says, How good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Though, of course, that wouldn't be written for a, a thousand years. But there's a whole bunch of land, Abram says. Why fight over this little bit of it? You choose the bit that you want. Now, it is interesting that Abram is letting Lot choose. All right, That's not the way things kind of work in the ancient world. This is a very much a patriarchal system. Uh, the eldest of the family, the patriarch of the family, would normally be the one who makes the decisions. Uh, he could exercise his rights. He's the older man. He could say, I want this bit. You go over there. Some people see it as a sign of humility in Abram that he doesn't exercise that right. It's possible. But it seems to me that Abram is putting the promised land up for grabs. 
Abram is putting the promised land up for grabs. Have a look at verses 11 and 12. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Lot chose the plains, so Abram lived in Canaan. And yet it could very easily have been the other way around. Lot could have chosen Canaan. It was a bad decision, a bad idea. (coughs) Sorry, oh my word. Sorry about that. Still not 100% recovered. It was a bad idea to leave that decision to Lot. He could have chosen Canaan. He could have chosen the promised land. And then Abram would have had to go in the other direction. Don't gamble with the promises of God. Don't offer to others what God has explicitly set aside for you. And here's what it shows. God is in control. God's providence is such that the land on the plains was was much more attractive than that particular part of Canaan. It was a bad decision. The outcome was okay. Now the lesson here isn't that God will ensure all outcomes are okay, no matter what decisions are made. But that ultimately, it isn't within human power to frustrate God's plans. God has a plan for Abram. He will make him into a great nation. And Lot needed to go in order for that to happen. Look at verses 14 to 18. The Lord said to Abram, After Lot had parted with him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south, east and west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great tree of Mamre in Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. It's like Abram has had a reset. These words are very similar to the words in chapter 12, verse 7. God reaffirms his promise for Abram in this particular land, although the promise has more detail this time. And Lot needs to go because Lot will not inherit this land. This isn't for Lot and his descendants. It is for Abram and his descendants, even though they haven't been born yet. Friends, we can trust the plan. We can rely on God. It doesn't mean we'll get everything we want. It doesn't mean we won't need to make wise decisions. It just means that God does have a plan for our lives. And we're not powerful enough to completely throw it into chaos. Friends, sometimes I think it's worth taking stock. I actually have a bunch of tissues over there. (laughs) thank you, thank you though Uh, sometimes it's worth taking stock of the providence of God I have to admit that I've been thinking a bit about this recently Um, we probably have all seen the video of former President Trump nearly being assassinated and instead of being killed he turned his head at just the right moment And the bullet, instead of killing him, grazed his ear. Now, I don't know if you've seen the whole video, but moments before that happens, he actually goes off script. He has a couple of teleprompters here and here. And he says, "Um, do you mind if I go off teleprompter? The crowd loves it. And he starts going off script and he starts talking about this chart that's over here. Now, if he hadn't done that, if he hadn't gone off script, if he hadn't started talking about this chart that was on, on the screen... He would be dead. It saved his life. Now, it doesn't really matter what you think about Trump, whether you think he's a hero or a villain, but that is the providence of God. 
Now, my hope is that Trump genuinely recognises that. He does a little bit, but I hope that he has a genuine, repentant faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and worships him because of it. Because that's what Abram does. He worships God. Abram begins and ends this chapter in worship. The Egypt situation shook him a bit, I think. That situation, that fear, pushed him away from God. But he's back now and he's trusting in God. Friends, I think that's something we can do. That Regardless of the outcomes, whether of our good and our bad decisions, we can call on God's name and worship him for bringing us to the place where we are right now. But there's another decision in this chapter that we need to look at. And it's a poor decision... With a poor outcome. Have a look again at verses 10 to 13. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt toward Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Lot looks at the hilly land of Canaan and he looks at the plains and thinks to himself, that's the spot. It's beautiful. It's lush. It's like the Garden of Eden. It's like the the Nile Delta. It's fertile. Uh, If you go there today, it is none of those things. (laughs) Uh, It has been completely destroyed um, uh, after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But it was apparently a fertile, beautiful place. Now, if you're an agriculturalist, if you live off the land, it's hard not to choose land like that. It'll always, always be easier to make a living from um, a plain than it will be to make a living from hilly land. Obviously, a, a lot of people... Uh, feel the same way. That's why they have gone to the cities of the plain. And Lot pitches his tent near the city of Sodom. Now the city of the story of, of Sodom and Gomorrah is so familiar that the author, Moses, can't even wait for the events to tell us about it. He tells us these cities were destroyed. But they were and that they were extremely wicked. Now Lot may not have known how wicked they were, or if he did, he might have figured that it, it wouldn't be a problem for him. Because he pitches his tents near Sodom. Now Lot had a choice. He was given the option of basically living anywhere he wanted. He could have picked the land of Canaan. But I think he was lured by the easy life. The wealthy life. The life that's represented by the plains. Maybe he figured he could make it work. Sure there are lots of other people around here that that were made evil by all this wealth. Maybe he knew that they were bad people. I mean, the plains are out there, why not make use of them? But the plains represent the smooth and wide road to destruction. And friends, this is why the Bible so often warns us about it. And particularly the lure of riches. Do you know what the most common thing kids say when, uh, you know, when you grow up, what do you want to be? Uh, maybe a, kid could, a young person could answer this for me. Um, so it used to be, it used to be a movie star. Kids used to say a movie star. Uh, what do kids say these days? Can I find someone? Uh, Elliot, since you're right there. What do you reckon? What do you reckon a lot of people want to be when they grow up? Rich. Rich? What in particular? Wallace. YouTuber. YouTuber. <laughs> they want to be a YouTuber. <laughs> millions and millions of people watching... Right, have it. Earning lots of lots of money, being able to buy all these fancy cars and houses, that's what kids want to be. And it's not necessarily wrong to want to be a YouTuber. I actually know a guy uh, who's part of the Snug Church. Um, he has a YouTube channel, has like nearly 100,000 subscribers, I think. So he's doing quite well. He's doing Minecraft videos, if anyone knows what that is. Uh, it's not necessarily wrong to want to be a YouTuber. It's actually really, really hard work. But the lure of riches is dangerous. Because you start thinking that, oh, I'll be fine. Yeah, sure, everybody else has been corrupted by this thing, but I will be okay, because I trust in God. And maybe you will be able to handle it for a time. 
But before you know it, when you're spending all your time surrounded by these people who are doing wicked things, you will find yourself adopting their culture. And before you realise it, you've been completely absorbed into it. It is interesting that when the story of Sodom and Gomorrah comes up a few chapters on, Lot isn't pit in a tent outside the city. He's inside of it in a house. He pursued the easy life and before he knew it, he was completely captured inside the walls of a wicked city. Now, some decisions are poor and the outcomes are poor. Some decisions will affect us for the rest of our lives and it can start because we wanted an easy life. We took an easy path rather than the harder, holier one. We can make decisions that will make things difficult for the rest of our lives. A Christian can make a decision that will affect their entire life. You can maintain that friendship with that person that you're not married to and before you realise it, you're having an emotional an emotional affair or worse. A young person could go to that party where drugs and alcohol are being used and before they realise it, they've done something they shouldn't know and they get behind the wheel of a car or they have an overdose. It could be a toxic friendship that leads to emotional heartache and trauma. Sometimes the decision was poor and the outcome is poor. We can make decisions that will affect us for the rest of our lives. Sometimes the decision was poor, but how bad it was wasn't clear at the time. Like a person who invests in the wrong company just before it collapses. Or you marry somebody who looks good and they turn out to be an abuser. It's possible to make poor decisions that have poor outcomes and some of them might affect us for the rest of our lives. And you might be thinking, how do I avoid that? I mean, is it just a matter of being closer to God, of praying more? Well, yes, you should pray, pray more. Pray for wisdom. James says, if we pray for wisdom, God is generous, he will give it to us. Seek godly counsel before you make a decision. Um, get with it, your brothers and sisters. Ask them, is this, does this make sense? But sometimes you can do all of that and it still ends badly. What then? When the outcomes are so bad that they affect you the rest of your life, what do you do? In the last couple of weeks, uh, I was watching a video and it was about this young couple. And this young couple started their life as a couple in a very unusual way. Uh, Their names were Lex and Nick Rennick. And they started as a gay couple. Now, the way this worked was that Lex was a trans man. Born as a woman, but presented as a man. And her partner, uh, Nick, said he was gay. Now, these two were living a life that is about as far away from God's plan as you can imagine, right? Living life in a way that is completely contrary to God's plan. But here's the amazing thing. God saved them. God saved them. Lex uh, has recovered her feminine identity and yet she has things that will affect her for the rest of her life. She was taking testosterone for so long uh, that her voice has been permanently lowered. Uh, She had surgery and so she won't be able to breastfeed her baby naturally. And here's the amazing thing. God gave them a child. Lex and Nick will live with some poor decisions for the rest of their lives. But God has redeemed them and their story is amazing. God can still make something beautiful out of the ugliness of our sins. God can restore beauty from the ashes of our poor choices. Friends, I keep coming back to worship. I keep thinking about it because this passage begins and ends with worship and so should we. Regardless of the path that our life takes, we will worship him. Regardless of whether our decisions prove to be wise or foolish, we can worship him and we will. If we are loaded with earthly riches or escape from danger with nothing but the shirt on our backs, we will worship him because he is worthy and he is good and he will use all of it for his glory. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning that we can come before you and worship you because you are so good. 
that Lord, regardless of how well our decisions turn out in the end, that you can and ought to be worshipped. Father, we pray that you would help us in our making decisions, that we would choose faith over fear, and that, Lord God, that you would accomplish so much good through us and through us being your willing vessels. In Jesus' name. Amen.